So as we, as we gather together as an Ignatian community this morning, on this special day, the eve of the Feast of St. Ignatius and the, uh, the end of the Ignatian year, I want, as we gather and we've got a few more people that are coming in, to invite us, because we are from all over the place, to maybe just introduce ourselves in the chat function, to just uh, click on chat and to write where you are from and one gift of Ignatian spirituality in your life. Uh, it would just be lovely to, to just see who's here and to connect with everyone just for two or three minutes before we get, get going. It's lovely to see all the gifts and all the different places people are coming from. I see lots of different gifts, finding God in all things, contemplation, community. No boundaries. So we'll just give one more minute for people to, to introduce themselves in the chat. So thank you. Thank you to those who put uh, their names and, and a gift in the chat. And please feel free to continue to do that during our time together um, as we spend this morning. Um, I'm going to uh, invite us into a time of prayer, a time of contemplation together in a few moments. Can I ask that everyone just ensure that they're muted uh, so that we don't have an interruption during the prayer time uh, or, the, or the talk? Um, and I will soon introduce our keynote speaker, 
uh, welcome to Father Roberto. I will, I will introduce him more a little bit later. Thank you for being with us. And I want to invite you now to just sit comfortably. If you want to switch your video off for the time of prayer, then please feel free to do that. But keep your eyes open for a change. We say Ignatian spirituality is a mysticism of open eyes, that we want to, to see what is going on around us. And we will be leading you in prayer this morning using a, a visual meditation, a kind of visio divina. And so if you close your eyes, you will miss you will miss it. So it's what you watch as, as Morongwa shares with us uh, our prayer for this morning and to just gently enter into that time together. We begin by becoming aware that God has been waiting for us to turn our attention to Him. We ask the Trinity for the graces of generosity and openness. We imagine the Trinity looking down on the world from all of time and seeing our world today. People struggling to make space for God, confused by many options and decisions, longing for peace and clarity of purpose. They see people excluded. Migrants unwelcome. Children separated from their parents in camps. Women and children abused. The Trinity see young people struggling to find an education, unemployed, without hope, lost. The Trinity see the earth, our common home, dying, deforestation, pollution, ice caps melting. Marine life choked by plastic. Jesus came to show us a different way, but we have not fully heard. Now the Trinity looks at us. Gathered here today online. Jesuits. Lay collaborators.
some young and filled with energy, some older with experience of life, some women, some men. From different parts of Africa, they desire to send us. They desire to send me. They invite us into partnership with themselves. To share a way to God through the spiritual exercises and discernment. That the transforming power of the exercises might make many men and women for others. The Trinity calls us to be a voice for those who are excluded. To fight for their rights. To work for a more just society in which all find welcome. To be ministers of the consolation of presence. They desire to send us to care for the young. To offer them a future and a hope. Through education and the knowledge that they have value. They ask us to care for our common home so that future generations may be able to live. To become less selfish, more conscious of our impact on the earth. and to inspire others to live with deep respect for God's creation. As I join the Trinity in looking at our world and its many needs, where do I sense the need for conversion in myself? What is the change of mind and heart that God desires for me? Can I allow God to reshape my life as he did that of Saint Ignatius? I take some time now to share my heart with the Trinity and to listen to what they have to say to me.
And so Sean will now lead us in our prayer. God of all people, you were there when the cannonball shattered the leg of Saint Ignatius, shattered his dreams, and shattered what he assumed his life would be. Even in a moment of pain and uncertainty, doubt and darkness, you spoke to Ignatius a word of peace and light. You showed him the path to you and the person he might become. We may not be soldiers standing in the path of a literal cannonball, and yet we've been hit all the same. Cannonballs shatter our own hopes and dreams and expectations. Like Ignatius, may we hear the compassionate voice of your son in the aftermath of these cannonball blasts. May we seek the face of Christ even when our dreams are shattered. May we turn and follow Jesus with the courage it takes to change and grow. As we come to the end of this Ignatian year, may we be shown the path to you, God of all people, and live out our vocation, becoming the people you have invited us to be. Give us the grace to work for reconciliation every day with you, with others, and with your creation. Open our eyes so we might see all things new in Christ. Amen. Amen. And so we, we come into this day um, grateful that God has brought us here um, to be together to celebrate this feast, uh, this very special occasion. Thank you for, for being here, for being with us today from many different places, uh, including Lesotho, Botswana, uh, the Eastern Cape, the Ignatian family in the Western Cape, uh, Natal, KwaZulu-Natal, um, so many different places around South Africa, Africa, and I know we also have people from other parts of the world, uh, including uh, from Kenya and from the United Kingdom, and there may also be other places that I'm unaware of. I'm wondering whether we have anyone here from Zimbabwe, um, and uh, just welcome to each one of you. Also just aware of the diversity that we bring in terms of faith traditions. Uh, Catholics, Anglicans, Methodists, Baptists, Dutch Reformed Church, that we are represented from many, many different Christian communities. And it's incredible to see how 500 and a bit years after uh, Ignatius was born, 500 years after the conversion, those reverberations of that experience of his conversion are being felt all around the world and that we are part of that ongoing legacy, that tradition that has been handed down. And I think Ignatius would be absolutely delighted to see the many different places that we come from, the many different traditions uh, that form the group that has gathered here today, representing uh, some of the Ignatian community that we are part of all around the world. I was recently very privileged to be in Manresa for a symposium on uh, Ignatian spirituality as part of this 500 year anniversary. And there were people there from 27 different countries and four different continents. And it was just such an amazing thing to be aware of the people, people like yourselves who I work with and our, our colleagues in this ministry together, um, and, and people from all over, people from Micronesia, from, from Australia, from the United Kingdom, from the United States, from at the Amazon, um, 
that all of them were brought into that, that conversation and one can see just how much Ignatian spirituality has spread to every part of the world. Um, and it, it gives me great joy to, to have that experience and to, to just sense our own part in that big picture. Most of you who are here today will know that it's been our tradition for nearly 20 years, in fact, just, just on 20 years, to have an Ignatian day on the Saturday closest to the Feast of St. Ignatius. And we have done that most years uh, since we started this work. Until COVID hit and we were a little bit uh, uh, derailed by COVID initially, but last year we knew that this being the Ignatian year, even if we were in the midst of a, a bad wave of COVID, we wanted to be able to celebrate together. And so not knowing how things would be, we decided to have an online event. And that is a huge gift because it means that we can gather from many, many different places. And it means that we can have the real joy and privilege of having Father Robert all with us uh, all the way from, from Kenya. So we come today to to celebrate, to celebrate as we always do as a community, the Feast of St. Ignatius, which is tomorrow. But we also come to celebrate the end of the Ignatian year, which began on the 20th of May last year, on the anniversary of the battle in Pamplona with the, the cannonball incident where Ignatius's leg was shattered, as you all know, and which was the catalyst for a complete turnaround in his life. So much so that 500 years later, we find ourselves together today from that legacy of the spiritual exercises and the Society of Jesus and all that Ignatius has left for us. And this morning, we're going to have a number of elements for our morning. We're going to begin most importantly with a talk from Father Arabatol and have a little bit of time for us to ask him some questions or to engage with him at the end of his at the end of his talk um, and then there will be a, a time for us to reflect and then a short segment on some wonderful work that's been done with young people uh, by Morongwa and Puleng and their team uh, in this Ignatian year and just to hear for young people what their sense is around conversion and the call to conversion. And then there'll be time for us to have a bit of connecting time together in small groups to share a little bit from our own experience and from what we've heard today and to allow ourselves to be uh, challenged as a community and to celebrate together. So it gives me great joy now to introduce to you our keynote speaker for our morning together, Father Arabatol, and to just tell you a few things about him. I could go on for a very long time because he's done so much uh, and if you go online, you will see some of the amazing things that he has done. So I'm literally just going to, to mention a few things about him. Uh, he's a Jesuit, comes from Nigeria, and he got his PhD in Theology and Religious Studies from the University of Leeds in England in 2004. And he served as the Provincial Superior of the East African Province of the Society of Jesus, which is, must be you know, a big job because it's a, it's a big area from 2009 to 2014. And then he served as principal of Hakima University College, the Jesuit School of Theology and the Institute of Peace Studies and International Relations in Nairobi, Kenya. And he's currently the president of the Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar, uh, headquartered in Kenya. He has edited quite a number of books and he's also written books. One of the books that I really thoroughly recommend to you is a book called um, Theology Brewed in an African Pot, um, which is really a wonderful, wonderful read. Uh, and in the time of COVID, when he wasn't dashing around the world to various places and, and doing all the traveling that he generally does, he put his time to good use and he wrote a book called uh, The Pope and the Pandemic, Lessons in Leadership in a Time of Crisis, um, also well worth reading. He's a preeminent scholar of African theology, deeply grounded in Ignatian spirituality, and he's someone that I know to be extremely generous in supporting and forming others. Um, he's a strong uh, voice against patriarchy and clericalism in the church and an advocate for women in the church as well. 
Uh, he's received several honorary doctorates. I'm not quite sure how many. I can't quite work it out, but uh, there are a number of them. And the most recent one uh, was received only last month on the 6th of June from the Catholic Theological Union in the United States. He is obviously uh, in huge demand and he's juggling a number of commitments today. Uh, with it being the end of the Ignatian year tomorrow. Um, so we are very especially blessed and happy to have you with us. Uh, thank you for giving of your time to come and share with us. Uh, and we really look forward to, to being up with you today and spending some time together. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Colleen Campbell. And uh, thanks to, to the uh, Jesuit Institute for putting this event together, the Ignatian Day, uh, to celebrate the end of the Ignatian year and the, and the eve of the Feast of St. Ignatius. Thank you to everyone who is on this call from several different countries, mostly from South Africa. Um, I, I feel privileged to be sharing this moment with each and every one of you. And thank you again, Anne-Marie, for your generous introduction. Um, when we had this conversation about what the, top, the, the topic or the theme of our conversation this morning will be, we settled on this particular one, making sense of our cannonball moments, the enduring gift of Ignatian spirituality. And even as we prayed this morning, the, the introductory contemplation, the prayer of Sean's beautiful prayer and your own introduction, and Mary, I just feel that most of what I uh, have been reflecting on to share with you are already contained in these particular moments. So, Thank you very much. It's, 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 a, it's a great introduction to this uh, making sense of moment, the enduring gift of Ignatian spirituality. And speaking of cannonball, um, I just wonder how many people on this call have seen a cannonball. I'd imagine if you have seen a cannonball. I was just in Ghana uh, this week, uh, where in the past, on previous visits, I was privileged to um, see the slave castle in Cape Coast. And that edifice, which is a historical monument, is decked out with cannons and cannonballs. Um, and those cannonballs, I should tell you, they look very ugly. And, and really designed to inflict, I would say, maximum damage possible. Um, I didn't, because you're not allowed to touch them, but I, I reckon each cannonball that I saw in Cape Coast could weigh about five kilograms. And, and thinking about it, and I can tell you, you definitely don't want one of those things coming close to you at the speed at which they go, let alone hit any part of your body. Um, but that's exactly what happened to Inigo. That's exactly what happened to Ignatius of Loyola on Monday, on Monday the 20th of May, 1521, in the field of battle in the Spanish town of Pamplona. And that's why we are here today to have a conversation to share about it, and more importantly, to try to make sense of it and make sense of it as it applies to our lives, which is something we've been doing during the past month or what we've the past year, what we've called the Ignatian year. When I look back on the year, as I have tried to do over the last few days, I'm just amazed at the level of creativity that we have seen across the Ignatian family globally. 
uh, Jesuits and collaborators and partners. And it would actually be, I think, impossible to make a complete catalog of all the diverse and fascinating initiatives undertaken by Jesuits, collaborators, partners in mission uh, during this year and to celebrate this auspicious milestone of the conversion of Ignatius of Loyola. But by now, most of you should be familiar with the so-called cannonball moments, that is uh, narratives of conversion, which has become kind of the signature initiative of the Ignatian year. When you just Google the, word, the, the expression cannonball moments, you see all kinds of things online and people recounting, narrating, sharing their own experience of conversion, of transformation, of change. When I think of it, uh, when I reflect on this idea of cannonball moments, one of the things that has helped me to sort of put it in context is uh, Pope Francis's own account in his book, Let Us Dream. He, he doesn't talk, Francis doesn't talk about cannonball moments, of course, but he talks about what he calls personal COVIDs. And that is in the context of, as we know, the pandemic. He talks about personal COVID. Now, the, the language may be different, surely, but the experience is exactly the same. A cannonball moment or a personal COVID is a time when everything comes to a halt. I should say a crashing halt. And Pope Francis calls it stoppage, stoppage. And he says about it, and I'm quoting him, this crisis unmasks our vulnerability and exposes the false securities on which we've based our lives. It is a time for honest reflection, a time for owning our roots. So you see, Ignatius's own cannonball moment was a stoppage. And we've heard this over and over again. All his plans, all his dreams, all his ambitions, all his projects, all his expectations stopped abruptly. And what did Ignatius make of his cannonball moment? Well, precisely how did he make sense of it? One of the things that came to me in my own reflection is that it's important to remember that Ignatius was not the first to have a cannonball moment. He was not the first. And how far back can we go? We can go to Paul of Tarsus. He had quite a bit of a cannonball moment. Or Peter, he had his own several cannonball moments. We could think also of Mary of Nazareth. On that, in that particular moment, when she had the experience of an angel visiting her, and revealing to her things that would transform her life completely. Or oh, Joseph, they all had their cannonball moments and scripture is full of these types of moments. I say this because for us, it is an experience that we can relate to. These moments of stoppage. So it's not just something that happened 500 years ago, it is a moment that we too can be in. Scripture is full of this, and perhaps to our life stories, our life journeys, our life narratives, they also have stoppages, cannonball moments. And as I reflect on the examples that I have heard and read, besides Ignatius's experience of cannonball moment, I'm struck by certain features which I think 
stand out for me, you know, maybe even define them. But I want to explore that a bit further. The first thing that strikes me when I reflect on experiences of cannonball is that we don't choose our cannonball moment. We don't choose our cannonball moment. Now, the next thing I'm going to say might sound strange, but it's important. And that is, although we may not realize it at the time, this moment, I believe, is given to us. It might sound strange to say it happens to us, but I prefer to say it's given to us. And I have read somewhere that it's given to us as a grace, but I'm not prepared to go so far yet to say it's given to us as a grace. But I will say that it's given to us and how we respond and how we handle it is what opens, us the, opens up the possibility of experiencing it as a moment of grace. I do not think it is automatic. I do not think there is an automatic link between the cannonball moment and grace. But I do believe that how we respond or how we handle it opens up the possibility of discovering and experiencing the grace or the graces of that moment. You see, one of the interesting things about how Ignatius responded to his cannonball moment was the ability, his ability to go over his life and begin to read it as a history of grace, as a story of grace. If he hadn't done that, if he hadn't done that, we probably would not be gathered here today. So that ability to read our life story, our narrative, our history, as a history, a narrative, a story of grace is important. And I would explain this further. And we know that when Ignatius did that, he certainly wasn't proud of his past. And even years later, he still wasn't proud of the many ways in which he tried to remedy the faults, you might say, of his past. But the events that followed his cannonball moment were certainly life transforming. And because he was able to read that as grace moment, as grace history, it became a turning point in his spiritual pilgrimage of conversion. His cannonball moment, read in a particular way, became a turning point in a spiritual pilgrimage of conversion. As I read, reflect on it in my own life, I know I may not be reflective enough that is able to put myself in the moment to see the grace of that moment. And that is understandable. Because first, a cannonball moment is often a shocking moment of pain and suffering. And, and it takes time to see a moment of stoppage as a time of grace. Cannonball moments could be earth shattering, traumatizing, disruptive, disorienting. And there are moments of intense encounter with and experience of our vulnerability, our fragility, and uncertainty. And that's what Ignatius experienced. This Macho Spaniard who thought the world was at his feet 
suddenly becomes vulnerable, suddenly becomes fragile, and he's not sure what his life will become now. So such moments, in such moment, it's not always easy to discover anything that would remotely resemble grace. And that is why I think to discover the grace of that moment takes patience, patience, takes time and focus. And these are things that Ignatius didn't have, but had to gradually, painfully begin to discover in his life. Patience, time, focus. You see, it's in this sense that I believe that one of the enduring gifts of this Ignatian year is precisely the theme, seeing all things new in Christ. It takes a fresh pair of eyes, what I call the fresh pair of eyes, a way of seeing things in a new light, a different kind of spirituality to read our cannonball moments and begin to make sense of them as moments of grace. A fresh pair of eyes. We know that that was exactly what Ignatius did with his cannonball moment. In his slow pilgrimage of conversion, he allowed the spirit to open his mind to a bigger reality, a bigger dream, and a more fulfilling, even more exciting adventure. And he responded radically. And thank God he did, because that's why we are here. Thank God he responded the way he did, with patience, taking time, cultivating his focus and sharpening his focus. I just use the word conversion to describe Ignatius's experience. But you know, sometimes when I think of it, I find it that it's a bit too tame a word for his experience. It's a bit too tame. Um, there is a tendency that I don't quite subscribe to that sees a cannonball moment, for example, in the case of Ignatius, primarily as a moment of conversion. That is, as a before and an after. One moment, there was one thing. The next, there was another. One moment, Ignatius was a self-absorbed philanderer and a wannabe famous knight. And the next, he was this ascetic, mystic, and a dogged pilgrim of Christ. Now, on the face of it, that is true. But I think at the level of our reflection on these moments or experiences, it might be a bit too simplistic, even reductionist. What do I mean? Well, look at the life of Ignatius more closely. Even before Ignatius found himself confined to his back on his bed of convalescence, grace was already at work in his life. When he tells his narrative, he goes all the way back to his family, people in his life who actually were channels and vessels of grace already intimating the presence and action of his life. Think of his sister-in-law, in whose image he actually saw God's face. You know, 
it's not enough, and that's why I say it's perhaps too simplistic or reduction is to simply say everything happened at that moment. There was this and now there was there is that. No, grace was already at work in his own life. So standing in that breach, standing in that breach in Pamplona, Ignatius was already in the crosshair of grace. I know this may sound theologically nonsensical, but I strongly believe that we're always a target, always a target of the grace of God. It's, if you could imagine it and picture this, it's like throwing darts, you know, throwing darts. God never stops trying. And we keep trying to dodge until God hits the bullseye. The cannonball moment may seem abrupt, but I really believe that it's not the onset of grace. It is a moment of entering more consciously into the stream, into the stream of God's own dreams and desires for us that have their origin in God. Think for example of Psalm 139. Even before I was put together in my mother's womb, you knew me. That's what I mean when I say Ignatius was already in the crosshair of grace. And so are we. So are we. Even in those moments, those cannonball moments, those earth shattering moments, it bears reminding that God was already carrying us in grace. So what is new in this experience, I would say again, is a fresh pair of eyes to read our life story in a new light. Now, speaking of reading our experience in a new light, and this could also be what we call discernment, especially in its personalized form called the examine, which is what I want to talk about as my next point. And I noticed in the chat box, several people indicating that the gift they have received from Ignatian spirituality is precisely the exam. I think it's an important tool for making sense of cannonball moments. But this is what I think. Now, people who are familiar with the exam, we know how it works. You know, you look back, you assess the quality of each moment of your day or a period of time in your life. And nowadays, as you know, we find other variants of the exam that have become popular and, in fact, even commercialized. You know, think of mindfulness and all the various offerings of mindfulness or even deliberate debriefing, as some call it. The way I was introduced to the practice of exam quite a few years ago actually made it look like a mechanical exercise. The examine was always something that happened after the fact. So I come to a point, I stop, I look back, then I continue only to stop again and the cycle repeats itself. It just becomes mechanical. So there's a certain repetitiveness to it that I quite frankly uh, have found boring. Okay. Ignatius knew nothing of the exam when a cannonball went through his legs. But think about it. Do you suppose for a moment that Ignatius let out a howl or screamed only later when he was doing an exam? Think about it, surely not. If I am hit by a cannonball, I will scream. I will yell. I will curse. I will swear. 
And that's precisely my point. That's precisely what the examine allows us to do, to be in the moment, to experience the depth and fullness of emotions that comes with that moment. That is where our encounter with God is most authentic and without pretense. Making sense of a cannonball moment can be helped by an examine that helps us, allows us to be present to the moment, to feel the emotions as visceral as this could be, and to let it out, to let it out in the moment. You see, I, I actually think that if we cannot yell and scream and swear at the moment of our cannonball experience, then it's not genuine. It may even be fake. And I think examine is precisely that gift that allows us to be present to God, who, as I said earlier on, is present to us in our cannonball moments because we are already in the crosshair of God's grace. That is why I am fascinated by people like Elijah who could say to God, enough, stop this nonsense, just take my life, I'm fed up. That's a form of examine in the moment. Or Jesus who could say, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? Or Hannah, who does not hold back her anger and pain in prayer to God. So I, I, just, I just believe, I have this strong belief. But if I do the examine right, I can better discover the graces of my cannonball moments. Not as afterthoughts or even ashes of a bygone experience, but as a moment of true encounter with the everyday God, a moment of true encounter with the everyday God. Next, I'd like to talk about imagination or reimagination as an important tool for reading our cannonball moments. You see, when I look at the life of Ignatius of Loyola, he strikes me as someone who cared about his life in the spirit. He developed an entire set of exercises to nurture his life in the spirit. And by the standards of his time, he was quite good at what he did. And so good was Ignatius that even today, we can still gather around the memory and practice of his legacy. But you know, I find what I call a streak of irreverence in the way that Ignatius engages his gift of imagination. Yes, he was keen to live an exemplary life as a follower of Jesus Christ, but Ignatius wasn't afraid to fall out of line. He was perfectly capable of seeing and doing things differently. You see, much of how he set up the society of Jesus offers very strong evidence of creativity and rule breaking. I won't go into the details, but even besides that, think also of how he took traditional biblical models and narratives and reshaped them to suit the purposes of his own experience. We might say that is what we call thinking outside the box, but that's a cliche. That's why I prefer to speak of irreverence in the use of his imagination. And how was Ignatius able to do this? It was primarily through his gift of reimagination. 
reimagination in the light of context and personal situation. Notice I speak now of reimagination, not just imagination. Before Ignatius, we already could imagine what the Trinity was about. But Ignatius reimagined the life and mission of the Trinity in the spiritual exercises, as we heard in the opening reflection. We already knew what the mission of Christ was about. But Ignatius reimagined this life in the spiritual exercises. We could talk about his reimagination of the relationship between Jesus and his mother Mary after Jesus' resurrection. So what is my point precisely? Well, it is simple. Thanks to the gift of imagination and reimagination, our cannonball moments can be read in so many different ways. And we don't need to be too afraid to read them in radically new ways as times and context and circumstances allow. Because that's precisely the theme or the point of the theme of the Ignatian year, to see all things new in Christ. So making sense of our cannonball moments calls us to be people who can not, not only people who exercise our imagination, but people who can exercise the gift of reimagination? In West Africa, which is actually where I'm calling from, we have an expression which says, shine your eyes, shine your eyes. Now, this expression has not made it into the Oxford English Dictionary yet, but I'm sure it's just a matter of time. It's quite popular around here. Shine your eyes. Shine your eyes simply means open your eyes and see reality for what it is. Wake up, don't be fooled or deluded. Open your eyes, shine your eyes. But how do you shine your eyes? Think of what you do when you polish the floor, or polish your shoes or some utensils. It takes a bit of work and effort to shine something or rather to bring out the shine in something. As I said earlier on, cannonball moments are what they are. They are given to us. But how we see them is another matter. To see them for what they truly are means that I'm able to shine my eyes. Shine my eyes. Be attentive, alert, and focused. Again, of course, the question is, how do you shine your eyes? Well, please let me issue a warning. Don't, don't try to apply polish to your eyes. That's not what I'm suggesting. Please don't. But we can find a clue from St. Ignatius himself. What opened his eyes to see the ways in which God was dealing with him. How did he gradually begin to understand the various ways in which God was present in his life? And in asking those questions, I come back to the familiar term, discernment. We all know and talk about discernment in common as a way of seeing God's will for us, either in our personal life or as a collective or a community. The fact is, and this is my point, and Anne-Marie put it so well in her introduction, the fact is we don't do discernment with our eyes closed. To make sense of his cannonball moment, Ignatius had to open his eyes. Yes, he read books, even though accidentally, but he paused occasionally to reflect. He even sometimes fantasized about imaginary things, he even stargazed at night. But gradually, through these activities of reading, of reflecting, of imagining, of dreaming, of fantasizing, 
Ignatius was shining his eyes. He was beginning to see all things new in Christ. And Anne Marie, as you put it, he was growing in the mysticism of open eyes. And that's important for us as we seek to make sense of our cannonball moments. We need the grace of shining our eyes. Again, following the dynamic or the logic of my reflection, which I will end quite shortly, to see all things new in Christ is not a static or fixed experience. It's not simply about trying to gaze at something, to fix one's eyes on something. It's a combination of exercises, of experiences, of activities, of practices that gradually, as we know in the Ignatian life, that enable us to open our eyes, to see reality more clearly, and begin to perceive God's fingerprints, God's footprints on the paths of our journeys and on the edges of our pilgrimages. As I'm saying this, I'm remembering the song, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. This clarity about God's presence in our cannonball moment can happen to the extent that I am able to shine my eyes. Cannonball moments, as I said, can be blinding, but we learn to discover and see the grace of it by shining our eyes, which is something we can all do in our reflecting and praying, in our meditating and contemplation, in our imagining and reimagining. So I'd like to leave it at that as an introductory reflection. And thank you so much for the grace and the privilege of sharing these thoughts with you. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much for a beautiful, beautiful reflection that really allows us so much food for thought, uh, really helping us to reflect on our own our own life experience. Um, I, there, are, there are so many phrases there that I'm going to take with me. Um, we are always a target of the grace of God um, and we need to shine our eyes. There are just so many gems and I want us just to hold this now and to have a little bit of time to engage with you uh, around it. But I wonder if we could just take five minutes uh, for anyone who needs to have a quick stretch or rush to the bathroom so that we can really give our full uh, attention and, and, and hearts to just the, the gift of a few moments to engage with you. So I'd invite you to hold on to what is it from what Father Robert has shared this morning that has touched you most deeply? What is it that has stayed and resonated in your spirit? Maybe there's a question, maybe there's a reflection, maybe there's just a phrase that you want to, to speak into the group, either in the chat box or as we have a few moments of, of conversation, maybe 15, 20 minutes to, to share after this quick comfort break. Um, so thank you very, very much, Father Arobatil, for, for your words that, that stay with me deeply, um, but we want to still engage with them a little bit more. So let's take a few minutes break and we'll be back at 11 minutes past sharp, which is exactly five minutes. So don't miss out because we will start uh, and you don't want to miss the conversation. So see you in five minutes. So if I can welcome everyone back into the space, 
uh, to just have a little bit of an opportunity for us to to hold the gift of what we have just received. Um, and I would invite anyone who would like to, to just uh, say what has stayed with you, what has resonated for you, what you're grateful for, what you're challenged by, um, what, what was new for you. Um, or if there is a question or something that you would like to ask Father Robert to while he's still with us for the next little while, uh, this would be your moment. So um, I would love to open the floor. Uh, please do just raise your hand so I can see you, um, if possible. Or if you would prefer not to speak, but you'd like to share in the chat, you're welcome also to do that. I think someone has a question or ah, reflection, okay. Ruth Barrett. Thanks, Ruth. You're, you're muted there, Ruth. Just unmute yourself. Okay. It's not a question. It's just something that struck me so forcibly in the way it was worded. That our transitional moments have to be cannonball moments because nothing less would stop us in our tracks. If we, if we could, we would stop ourselves and not allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. um, because it always accompanies suffering, deep suffering. Thank you, Ruth. So I just love that um, because it so aligns with and resonates with my thinking. Thank you. Thank you. And there are a number of comments coming up in the chat box there as well. Um, we don't choose cannonball moments. They are given to us. How we respond opens us up to the possibility of grace. Thank you, Anne. Um, Alfreda from Zimbabwe, cannonball moments given to us as a grace. Um, grace was already at work. He was already in the crosshair of grace. Jenny Beer, discerning God's will for your life needs to be done with open eyes. Thank you, Johan. Others who'd like to speak. Dave from KZN. You're muted there, Dave. And now, yeah, hi, and yeah, I just kept on echoing for me was that what grace is. And I just remember Karl Rahner, a distinguished Jesuit in the Vatican II Council, mm -hmm. said in the book, Grace is the self gift of God. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Dave. Please feel free to, to jump in any time, uh, Father Robert. <clears throat> Jackie. Thanks, Anne-Marie, and thank you so much for such a, an insightful and inspirational um, presentation. I'm so, I feel so fortunate because I'm reminded that, to use your words, Father, that God is constantly throwing his darts of grace. And I think that well, we know that with every single person, that dart does find its mark because people are brought to their knees. People are shattered. They have their cannonball moments. But the sense of gratitude that I feel is that, sadly, not everybody is able or willing to take that stoppage and turn it into a time of grace, however long that time lasts. And I'm just filled with gratitude that we are able and albeit painfully and slowly, but that we are in the process of shining our eyes. So thank you for that reminder. Thank you, Jackie. I'm coming to you now, Anne. There are a couple of other uh, messages here as well. Heather Griffin talking about Imagination, picking up on imagination. Ina takes work, effort, being alert, attentive, focused. And Pearl from Botswana, the gift of imagination and the gift of reimagination. Thank you, she says. Anne. Thank you, Father. Um, 
there was a whole lot of resonation going on within me when you spoke about the examen and particularly the word boring. So I would like you to please speak into that a little bit about the practicality of doing it in the moment. Um, could you just speak into that a little bit for me, please, or for others as well, maybe? Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. I just feel there's so much wisdom uh, coming of our, of our reflection and our, you know, our thoughts. I, you know, as Ruth said, you know, cannonball moments. Uh, if we could stop it, we would before it happened, you know. Uh, knowing what it comes with, or if we could imagine what it comes with. And, um, and so that it becomes really a moment of God's self-giving, as, uh, as Dave put it. Um, and this idea that eventually God's God's of grace will find their mark. And, and that's something we should be grateful for that we're able, because in fact, in fact, when you think of it and you're absolutely right, not everybody is able to experience this as a moment of grace and for many different reasons. And as we are able to do that in itself becomes a moment of gratitude. Um, and so speaking of examine, as I said, you know, I was giving my own experience really because at some point I really found it become too boring. It was something you waited to do I at a particular be, time. I've gone sound because I can you know? hear very little. So, um, you know, it's, it just became, you know, something I waited to do at a particular moment you know, and following particular steps. And that's precisely why I thought it become too boring because it's almost as if the experience happened. The event took place and I'm waiting till a particular time, a particular moment to begin to focus on it, to begin to try to examine it for signs of grace for my own inability or ability to respond or what this might mean for me in the future. So my point is, there is no element of examine that doesn't make sense for us here and now, or rather that needs to be postponed my awareness of God's presence, my desire for God's light in my life is not something that happens at 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. or 10 p.m. before bed. It's here and now. My own vulnerabilities, my own shortcomings, an awareness of these is not something that I postpone until I can be in the comfort of some space or time to begin to appreciate it, or my own desire to do better, or my own supplication to God to help me do better. It's in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a certain level of, and I like the word and I use it often, irreverence to say, look, you know, you know, keep your exam until later, but I just want to be present to what's happening to me right now. And that's exam enough for me. Thank, Thank you. you, Anne. Just uh, to read what Noziat has said, because it, it's also about the exam and she's just said, the exam was for the most life-giving gift I received on the talk, the actual moment and its reaction in their authentic nature. Um, I'm battling to make this thing not jump up. Um, our true revelation of God's grace. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for this. And Bernadette says, I was touched by the reality of what goes on in the present canon moment until change happens through grace. We do not have to ignore real pain, vulnerability, uncertainty, 
but to be real to life as it presents itself. Thanks, Nazirat. Sean and then Diana. Thank you, Henry, and um, thank you, Father Roberto, for the presentation. Um, I think that what really struck me was the idea that um, the grace of the cannonball moment kind of comes in when we reflect on the cannonball moment, that it's that process of reflection that kind of opens our eyes to the grace, you know, that perhaps has always been working even outside of that cannonball moment. But I think I've seen that a lot in my life and people I've spoken to and listened to that um, it's not the cannonball itself that's important. It's the reflection that really kind of transforms it into a grace. Um, and I also like the idea that that's a process, that it's not like one day soldier, next day pilgrim, that, um, you know, it takes, it takes time. And I think you see that even in the autobiography, some of the chapters immediately after the cannonball, he still seems to be a bit uncertain. He still seems to make some very immature decisions and that kind of thing. I think that's consoling <laughs> that I don't have to like be there already. That um, it, it takes time, it takes process, it takes reflection. And um, it's a bit like the exam, you know, it begins very mechanically. And as and with time, it becomes an organic kind of part of your life. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that idea. The process and of reflection. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. And I think you put it so well in terms of being a process and being an awareness, not just of one moment static fixed, but really being able to, to be in that stream, you know, to be in that stream, you know. And I also like the, someone just posted a comment about, you know, that if we see as God sees, we literally shine. You know, uh, it's as the psalm is saying, to be seen in God's own light or to see in God's light. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, thank you. Diana. Uh, so thank you very much, Anne-Marie and Father Arabeto. Um, I think for me, um, I am wondering um, how it is that we facilitate an understanding of cannonball moments in our relationship with others and our community. So um, we are deeply aware of, I mean, we've lived through a world cannonball moment in a way, um, and it seems very significant that, that they are moments that need to be recognized as such. And if with the failure to recognize them as cannonball moments, they lose their power of transformation. And these experiences are occurring around us in many people all the time. And part of our work as priests and spiritual directors and who are involved with communities where we wish we could bring about greater transformation, how is it that we are able people to recognize these moments more significantly? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think one of one, as I hear you, one of the things that, that's coming to my mind is that sometimes um, it's also possible that we can so individualize this moment that it actually becomes a moment of self-absorption. You know, it's, it's my pain, it's my suffering, it's my cross, it's my burden. And, and that can begin to become for us just a moment then of just becoming more and more absorbed in our own, um, uh, shall we say, calamity. But looking at the life of Ignatius, as I said, there is an element of it that calls us to expand our vision, to see something bigger, uh, to experience a bigger, a wider reality. And I think that's where that sense of community becomes important. That what is given to me is also possibly given to another. And so two things would um, ensue. First, that I'm able to be attentive to the other, you know, whether as a community or as an individual, because we all have our cannonball moments. And that second, and I think this is why Ignatius becomes very important, 
that the grace of this moment could also be enriching for others, which is why we are here. You know, we are still drawing from the grace of Ignatius's own moment, and we are still being enriched by it. So being aware that this, what is given to me could also possibly be given to others. And that, and I mean that in, in terms of the experience itself, that experience that could be traumatized, that could be painful, that could be a burden. But then also realizing that as I journey through the stream of my own moment, that that can become grace for the other. That can become light for the other. That can become transforming for the other. And as I said, I find no better example of this than Ignatius himself, whose cannonball moment has become for each one of us mm -hmm. gathered here today, an experience of grace so many centuries later. But thank you very much. I really appreciate that perspective. That's very really helpful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Pulling. Yes, some of it has been answered, but I also come to the emphasis, but I just also want to say thank you to um, Roberto for the beautiful talk this morning. I really appreciate, and to you, Anne-Marie. Um, you spoke of mindfulness as, you spoke of the examen first, and you also spoke of the the examine being commercialized and people using the language of mindfulness. Um, and also I'm, I'm looking, I hope my thoughts come together, but I also you also spoke of the moment in the examine, we, we enter into a moment. I'm thinking of leadership. I don't want to go far. I want to stay in Africa, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of leadership in, in Africa that has been generally be generally poor. Um, and um, my thinking comes to a point where you are saying, you, you also use Psalm 139 as a space where we have been gifted and there's, there's also a, a question or, or also the grace of the cannonball. Um, as we have put it, and that everyone else has been gifted. Is it a question that when we look at the examine, which you, I think you've, you've somehow answered it, when we look at the examine, it has tended to be privatized. And also our leadership in Africa has privatized everything in such a way that it, it becomes either family or friends. Um, and at the end of the day, we come to call ourselves Christians, whether it's in leadership or it's in being Christian, yeah, being Christians. What, what causes that? What, what makes us miss that? I, I know that you've, you've some of covered it, but also I think in, the, in this poor leadership that we are facing in this world, especially in Africa, I hope it makes sense. Thank you, Pauline. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, you talk about leadership, and I happen to be uh, making this call from, uh, from Nigeria, from Lagos. And one of my anxieties since I started is, you know, God, I hope the power doesn't go off. Um, that's been one of my anxiety. And I know if the power goes off, the generator will kick in and then I wouldn't hear anything and you wouldn't hear anything. Um, that's just a, an indication of the failure of leadership. Um, I come from a country where um, that has become so dysfunctional, so dysfunctional that even to call people who are in charge leaders is actually a misnomer. Uh, because they tend to basically fulfill every single criteria 
uh, that you would need to qualify people who should never be allowed in one, in any form at all to come close to uh, taking charge of responsibility for other people's destinies and lives. So um, the points you make is very uh, well noted, uh, but then you use the term privatized, which I understood to mean that we then fail in the consciousness or ability to be aware of, as we were just saying, of what our moments could have as impact, as gifts, as graces for others. It's all about me. We can be, I can become so self-absorbed that I do not see beyond my immediate confines, you know, my immediate circle. And as you say, that's where examine becomes or mindfulness becomes um, a gift. Am I able to see beyond that which is of mere personal interest to me? Am I able to see needs that don't necessarily um, serve uh, people who are close? Am I able to see that, you know, there is, you know, they put it in the, in, in the language of our conversation, am I able to see that everybody around me is experiencing a cannonball moment? Whether it's in the widespread poverty that surrounds me as it does here in Lagos, the chaos, the anxiety, the dysfunctionality of government. I mean, where do we start? So I think, um, it's a challenge and unfortunately not all the leaders i know here uh know a thing about ignatian spirituality or the gift that it offers us um so thank you for me Hilani. Hilani, do you want to just unmute yourself? Oh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I was waiting for you to say I should go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Father, for um, that inspiring presentation. Uh, mine is a, um, a comment, um, come confession to you, Father. Of course, my uh, co-participants here are allowed to overhear the confession. Um, and um, it's in relation really to, to what you said about the uh, examen um, as being boring if it's got to be done in terms of how um, they have been explained to us by um, St. Ignatius. Now, I just want to uh, say that I am guilty of breaking the rules as it were. And, and I hope my uh, colleagues here from Botswana won't take me to task. Um, I think they're hearing it for the first time to hear. Um, but I'm quite guilty of uh, breaking the rules. Why? Because uh, precisely for what you said about these cannonball mo moments when they do happen, <laughs> You know, when these uh, ducks are flying thick and, you know, are, are fast and thick, uh, and you cannot really um, allow them to kind of cool down, you want to be able to respond in the moment. I don't know how to put it, but I think for me, those cannonball moments are, are very intense. And it isn't just like they are far and few in between. So when those cannonball moments, as I say, the darts that you spoke about, the grace <laughs> that God is actually throwing at you, and uh, they come with such in intensity and speed and frequency, how do you deal with that? Because you also even come to a point where um, because God is after you, he doesn't even give you the time <laughs> to kind of um, ignore what's happening. He's really after you and you have to act. So I think for me, uh, this being a, as I say, a personal sort of thing, uh, I've come to a point where 
the examen is something that happens on the go, on the fly, as things are happening. Because again, one has got to capture those moments as they happen. And as I say, given the intensity of all that's happening, um, you just simply have to um, uh, react then, then. And it isn't something that you are also um, going to forget. As I say, God is after you and God is actually making sure that you do get the point that he does want you to act. So I think I'm just, I don't know, I'm bringing this, it's something that is very practical. Uh, but at the same time, I want to believe that uh, my little sharing of what I'm saying here maybe can drive the uh, point home, which is the point that you made, that, you know, some things can be so intense. Even at night, when it comes, you know, happens at midnight, I literally have to get up and do something, put it down immediately, because I cannot then go back to sleep, as it were. So um, I hope I'm making sense, but I'm just simply saying it really comforts me. Uh, that you spoke about this, uh, because again, I think uh, I've had to go through this process of feeling guilty <laughs> of literally doing or going against the grain of what the examine is all about. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, um, Melanie. I think I heard recently that public confessions are allowed and absolution can be given in such circumstances so it's granted uh, but thank you very much i like what you said about the, you know this idea that god is after us but you know and this idea of you know on the go and on the fly but you know as you were speaking i re it just struck me you know ignatius really doesn't talk about examine ignatius talks about examine of consciousness you see, and we have we have become just stuck with one part of it. And yet I think the purpose of the exercise is actually the second part, consciousness. He didn't say examination of conscience. He talks about examine of consciousness, precisely that ability to be always conscious. And consciousness is not simply a reflexive exercise. It is being in the moment. It's being in the stream. So I just, you know, I'm saying this to say that, you know, I find your, your, your thoughts quite insightful because it just brought to my mind for the first time I'm, I'm remembering and saying to myself, you know, when I was introduced to the spiritual exercises and Ignatian spirit, they talked about examine of consciousness. But over the years, I just used the shorthand examine, you know, which becomes a practice. And that is periodic rather than an experience of consciousness in the moment, being in the moment as God is in the moment. So thank you very much for that uh, reminder. Thanks, Pilani. Thanks. Robert, so we have, we have time for the two more hands that are up. Um, and I encourage you also to just take a look at what's been put in the chat uh, box as well. There are a lot of beautiful reflections being shared there too. So um, uh, let's have the next person. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Seth, uh, but your hand is up just there. Seth. You'll have to explain me Hi, when you say your name. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Anne Mary. Um, yeah, my name is Nsaising. Uh, sorry, it must end with the. I'm using my son's laptop. Um, I don't know why my picture is upside down. <laughs> so please bear with me. Um, yeah, and my name ends with G, not F. It was an error when I typed it joining. So it's insane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Father. Uh, so I'm just sharing. Um, yeah, it's just a comment for me um, with regards to what Father talked about uh, regarding um, God's grace, um, that we are always a target of God's grace. Um, that, you know, personally, I have um, found that, you know, when I go through storms and troubles, 
I, I used to really question God a lot. Why am I going through this? Um, why have you forsaken me? Um, where are you? But um, I have also grown to understand and believe that God's grace is always with me. More importantly, when we are going through the storms. And um, the scripture that I have really um, embraced to put this very clearly for me, it's in Exodus uh, when the children of Israel are walking through the sea to the promised land. And um, in contemplating on that scripture, I have come to use it to understand that even when you are going through the storms, God is able to part the sea for you. So as you are walking in the sea and you're walking through your storms, the storms are parted and you're able to walk through them because God's grace is with you at that moment. You may feel that you are alone, but God's grace is with you. And the storms are basically the sea waters on either side of you. And the path is being created by God's grace. And, um, you know, you just don't give up or don't give in. You need to keep the faith. You need to keep the hope because at the end, you are going to reach the end of those storms and you are going to reach the promised land. And that's where you can even um, experience your cannonball uh, moments and uh, you are able to embrace that craze fully. Um, thank you. Just wanted to share that. Thank you for that. And now just a moment for Alfreda and Paul, just brief, uh, and then we don't unfortunately have time for any more comments uh, for now. We'll, we'll have time to share together and to, to unpack more uh, what we've received from Father Robert Hall today. But um, we just have time now to listen to Alfreda and Paul uh, before we go into our next into our tea break. Alfreda. Thank you, Anne Mary. I would like to thank Father in a very, very special way for his profound inputs. And I've actually realized that uh, this is what comes into the spiritual exercises. And I'll just, I have noted down what I would like to say. I would like to take it into the spiritual exercises, be it me personally or the people that I journey with. Uh, first point is that the, the cannonball moments are real. And the point is, how do we respond to them? Perhaps these are moments of grace, whether we notice it or not. And this becomes an experience, but still we need to shine our eyes. And how do we shine our eyes? It is God who is dealing with us. It may be I or the retreatant may cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that we remember Psalm 139. So I want to remember the above, be it in my personal life or the people that I journey with. Once more, thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Alfreda. Paul. You're muted there, Paul. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And thank you very much, Father, for the input. And thank you to all the participants for the 
you know, reflections. Um, you mentioned the shine your eyes. And I just wanted to say that in Setswana, we also have something like that. In Setswana, we actually say Tsoha, meaning wake up. You know, you are awake, but they are not actually awake. So with this Tsoha, we actually talk about be conscious, be present, you know. So that's the Setswana way, even in our if you know our national anthem, even in our national anthem, we say tsohang, tsohang banana, meaning wake up, wake up men. So it's actually saying that, you know, you are there, but you don't, you are not really conscious, you are not really present to all the graces. So as we're talking, that's what came to me, that, you know, when you say wake up, I wake, I wake, so that they are awake to all the graces, all those thoughts that are flying of grace, so that you can be able to embrace and accept them. Thank you. That was very short, and marie <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Pearl. Thank you very much, Pearl, and thanks, Alfreda. Thank you so much. That's, those are very insightful comments. Mm -hmm. And also to, um, to those who are writing in the chat box, and uh, Shindi, Juno, and thank you all very much. So we are, we are at the end of our time with Father Roberto. I don't know if there's anything more you would like to say in conclusion uh, before I just thank you for being with us today. Is there any last comment that you would like to? No, I, mine is also to thank you for the invitation <laughs> and thank everybody for the comments because I just feel much more enriched, you know, having heard and listen to the comments and the feedback and the sharing, I just feel much more enriched by it. It just also opens up my perspective of this conversation about Cannonball Moments. So thank you so much to everybody. And thanks, Anne-Marie. Thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity, the generosity of your time, the generosity of the preparation that has gone into today. I think you can see from the comments and the engagement just how it has touched us and it has left us with, with so much to engage with. And we're not gonna stop the engagement here, although Father Robert was not able to stay with us for the whole morning. We're going to continue this journey, uh, taking what you've shared with us, taking it into a time of personal reflection and then into our small group conversations. And really there has been just such a wealth, such a richness that you've shared with us out of your own experience your own reflection that I think certainly will live with me. I will hold it, I will live into it, and I am I am absolutely sure that they are echoing uh, for others in the room. Um, and just thank you very, very much for, for that gift that you've given us today. Really, really appreciate it. So we are going to now um, share the question that Father Roberto is leaving with us to, to think about and to ponder a little bit more. We've begun to unpack it already in the conversation that, that we've had, but we want to really take it into reflecting on your own personal experience. Um, so I'm going to screen share it just for a moment. So here is the question. Uh, I can make it do its thing. Um, why is it not doing its thing? Okay. So here's the question. Recall to mind your own cannonball moment, a time of stoppage or crisis. What helped you to see it in a new light and what helped you to discover the graces of that moment? So really a time for us now to take uh, that deeper into our own experience. I'll put it up again just in a moment for you so you can write it down. We're going to have a break now and we will come back at in half an hour's time at 20 past um, 11, which gives you time to do that reflection and to have some tea before we move into the second part of our morning. So we'll see you at, uh, what did I say? 20 past 11, 20 past 11. See you then 
Many, many thanks and God bless Father Robert all. Thank you for being with us. So welcome back to everyone. Just going to give us another 30 seconds for people to just rejoin us. I hope that you've had a, a good break for tea and some time to just reflect and allow what we were hearing to, to settle within you a little bit. If you're back, you may like to just switch your video on for a moment or two so that we know you are with us. Awesome. I think most people are, are back. So I'm going to invite uh, Morongwa and Puleng to for the next uh, 15 minutes or so to share uh, some videos and to just share with us a little bit of the work that they have been doing in this 500 year anniversary with young people around uh, the experience of cannonball moments and the conversion um, before we go into our breakaway rooms to have some time to to share about the morning and where it has left us. So I'm going to hand over to them now to take us forward for the next 15 minutes or so. Good morning. Good morning. So I'll play a video and then we'll, we'll say something afterwards. Hello guys, my name is Dom Zodwa and I'm from South Africa. I am here to talk about my experience and journey within the spirituality. So within the Ignatian spirituality, I have learned a lot. Firstly, I have learned how to pray and different ways of praying, communicating with God and know that God exists and listens. And he also respond. And also I have learned that within the spirituality, I have learned about my feelings. I have learned how to show my emotions. I have also learned that within the spirituality, that I can speak up and stand for my truth. As the youth of this country, we have faced up with a lot of issues. Firstly, we have high rate of unemployment. And secondly, we faced with youth currently can't pay their fees and can't afford to pay for their universities and college. In this spirituality, I have learned to stand up for myself, speak my truth and know that God is everywhere. Hello world, my name is Tane Gandlubu. I'm from South Africa and I'll be telling you guys about my journey in the Ignatian spirituality. So the Ignatian spirituality has not only helped me to grow in my spiritual life, but it has also helped me to want to look at other aspects of my life. I have since grown mentally and emotionally. The spirituality has also helped me to want to invite God in everything I do. I can now talk to God about anything I do and feel his presence in everything I do. One of the four UAPs is about journeying with the youth. And I think it's important that we know that we live in a digital world and this is where some, if not most of us as a youth are found. So I think digital is the future and the church can have room to reach out to us through digital spaces. But sometimes, unfortunately, the digital world is not the safest space as this is where trafficking, cyberbullying, and recruitment by extremist organizations takes place. And this fact cannot be ignored. My other concern is the youth on the other end of the spectrum who do not have access to the digital world. How do we then get them to journey with us and have a relationship with their God? Modern, the Kamala Mutum, I'm sure. Diane Trotchel, so is Ignatian spiritualism that I'm a being. 
Bengani fuche chesi chini chushin. Eko bengani mwenye ignition spirituality ndi boni lo ba ni chabani na bando abando abanga sugu emakaya fana na wam abando fuche imbono zabo zinga fani nezi zam. Eko ambeni kutoesha tifunde na ngi ba lilega sente ignitions apo awa chukula ikienen poli. Ndi boni lo ba kama umdo kuni anzeleki lenga mwenye matoesha ube buta chaka uba zizo zindo zisaka yo ez zizo zindo zisanza bando ez. Fuchi ndi fundi hile kuba na mafrenja kwa zili ba amtacha amiselo yola apo elikuli kaya laki. Ndi boni hile fuchi kuba ushaba lecho ni mwanya ama kwaesha kwa ya funeka silu chandi, silu chana nje fuchi, silu nabele. Sikuwa azba siba ngayeti na angona sikabana na abu abandu. Ndi boni hile fuchi kuba na mwanya ama kwaesha sichu usachani umdo uombi kani na mwanya ama kwaesha kufungia nyanzile kwa ba ufundi kwa mnyo umdo. Ufundi fuchi na ba izi ndo zinzo chani. Diboni ile futhi ukuba ekukhuleni kwethu isakwazi basitshinje nabanye abantu senze impilo zabo zibengcono enkosi My first encounter with the Saint Ignatius spirituality was scary and enlightening at first scary in the sense that I could not communicate what I was feeling at that point in time and it was enlightening in the sense that I got to discover a lot about myself and how I can better improve my relationship with God through prayer and reading scriptures. The excluded in South Africa comprises majority of us young people where innocent bystanders are shot, who are protesting for rights such as fees must fall, where police are always responding with violence towards protests that young people are coming up with, and students like Michael Komape who went to school and died in a pig latrine toilet. So these are a majority of the people that are excluded within our economy. But Pope Francis encourages us to say thou shalt not to an economy that is excluding and that is unequal. This has prompted the Institute to come up with programs like Inyihamba Ninkosi, which is a program that helps us in journeying with the Lord and improving our relationship. This has been made available to us, the students who are from marginalized societies, the townships, or unprivileged backgrounds. We have been given the experience to actually journey with the Lord as we are experiencing a lot of mental issues. These are spaces that were created by the Institute to help us identify ourselves and become better companions with Christ and improve our relationship with God. Hello world, I'm Wintley from South Africa and I'm going to be telling you about my journey with Ignition Spirituality and my desire for journeying with these. My journey with the spirituality has given me so much spiritual growth. I have learned that having a relationship with God means that I can approach Him with ease and also being patient enough to hear what He has to say in response. My desire for journeying with the youth is to be mindful. We have to be mindful of our common home our life-giving environment. We learn in the spirituality that we are all made in God's image and we human beings have to coexist with other living things set out onto the earth. By coexisting, we don't just live with it or accept that something is there. A lot of care comes with it. Greed is not good. Pope Francis reserved his strongest criticism on the wealthy who ignore the issue of climate change and its disproportionate effect on the poor. Climate change will probably hit developing countries in the next coming decades. We need to be considerate of their needs, their agriculture, their forestry, and their fishing. Pope Francis not only asked us to look at this environmental issue in an ecological way, but he also asked us to look at this in a spiritual perspective. It is in the Bible. God is asking us to look after our common home. And together, we are obligated in using the Earth's resources responsibly and we have to recognize that every living thing has a value of its own in God's eyes. Okay, we just want to say thank you and good morning to you all. Um, this is the work that uh, the Institute has done. Um, I just want to begin first by thanking also the community in Botswana. We started this journey together. Um, and it was beautiful to journey together, though with 
pressures of work. Um, they also had to do it on their own, but the results that we found are quite similar. So we, um, Maroma is going to talk about a few things that we managed to pick up on this research. I know that the bar has been set very high. I hope we do the same justice, but we'll try our best. Um, I'll hand over to Muruma just to say a little bit about, I know it's, 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 not, it's quite a long paper that um, I have uh, reflected on or written, and we continue to, we haven't stopped with this research. This research still continues. So just for time and um, to be aware of that or to be sensitive of our time, I'll, I'll ask Muruma to, to begin and then I'll follow after. Thank you. Um, so my conversion uh, on working with young people, I think has a lot to do with um, gathering information. Um, I remember when I was growing up, the term or the phrase, you know, this is how things are done, or this is how things have been done. And this is how things will be done. This is how they will be done. So with young people, this phrase just doesn't work, you know. Um, you, they, they, they're, they're, they're curious, they want to know, they are confident, they ask questions, you know, challenging questions. So I had to, you know, get information for myself firstly, and also to be able to, to join with them, to be able to interact with them, um, like more, more fully or more friendly. I think one of the, one of the things that came up in the research that um, in the team we were not shocked, but surprised to learn was the use of social media. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, we just thought that the best thing to do is just to move everything online to get or to target or to reach young people. But we realized after the research that this doesn't work because young people said um, they have been bombarded with uh, social media or they have been you know, forced because of the pandemic to do things online, like lessons have been moved online, everything is done online. So the church should be very careful in terms of moving stuff online, you know, in as much as, you know, there are ways that we can, that we can use to, 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 to get them online, but they prefer like in-person contact, in-person interaction, and they want to be with their peers. Another thing they mentioned was that um, we don't give them a chance to, to be active in the church. So as older people, we, you know, we want to think for them. We want to do things for them. We want to influence how they think. We want to influence how, how they are. And they just want, you know, they just want like more freedom, but freedom not to be disruptive and to, you know, to be wild, but the freedom to be able to, to, to explore. You know, our Father Robert mentioned earlier that St. Ignatius was not afraid to do things differently. And this is what young people are saying. Young people are saying they want to do things differently. And they want us as, as older people to, to be with them, you know, to be able to, to guide them, but not to be, you know, like a judgmental presence, you know, in their lives, especially in the church. Um, another thing they mentioned um, was around their family, you know, what constitutes a, a family unit. We, we know that um, in our times today, um, the family does not only consist of a mother, a father, and two children, or a mother, a father, and children, but um, families that, you know, they, they, they come from are different from the, the model, you know, the, the model family, you know, so they are questioning things like that, you know, how does the church um, interpret or how does the church define, you know, the family. Um, another interesting thing that, oh, well, interesting for me was that they, they don't have role models. This was a shock and I'm sure it's a shock for, for some of you. They don't have role models. They struggle with role models. I mean, when we were growing up, it was very really easy to, you know, point out um, so-and-so is my role model. If it wasn't my parents, you know, there was a neighbor who I could look up to as my role model. There was someone on TV that I could look up to. There was someone at the church that I could look up to as a role model. 
But young people today are saying they don't have role models. You know, what they see on social media, what they see in, in TV, um, it's all fake, like this fake lives, you know, it's all fake lives. Um, what they see in the church, you know, us as, you know, grown people in the church, uh, we are, what we are saying or what we are preaching, we are not really doing in our lives. So we are, we are, when we are in the church, we are saying something else. But when we go home or when we are in our communities, you know, we are, we are, we are different people. So we don't take church home or we don't, we don't take church into our lives. So they, you know, they can see that and it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't look good. Maybe I'll stop here, Pule. Okay, just to maybe take from where Mronga stopped. I think one of, one of the big things for me when this work started was um, the hope that the society at large had that there is a need to work with young people. Previously, the institute did not really target or yeah, target young people, maybe just to, to put it that way. We were just working with those that we were meeting, but this time we, we were conscious and we wanted to hear what young people were saying. Like what Muruma was saying, and also to add what Father Oroberto said this morning, I, I didn't know young people, to be honest. Um, I think also age speaks for itself. Um, but I wanted to hear their examen or their moment. And, but there was also an assumption that's what they want. They want social media. And, and I was surprised by them when they said, we don't want social media. We've done enough with social media at school. And, and exactly what Moronga was saying. So maybe just to also say the ages of young people that we met, it was between 16 to 35. That's uh, the youth age in South Africa, if, I, if we are not wrong. Um, but we didn't reach the ages of like over 30 something. Many of them were, were below 30. So this is what they said in the conclusions. Um, so these are things that they're asking from the church. They're saying priests and pastors should be less clerical. And it's something that Pope Francis keep, keep on saying that priests should be less clerical. Um, and this is what they said. They said this would make us to return back to the church or to attend church or services. Um, they also emphasize on vocations in teaching them. Um, they, they, they are willing to be taught. Uh, this would give them confidence. So they, they, they felt that they are less confident. One of the young people that spoke in, in the video say, spoke about uh, mental issues that they are facing. That, that was one of the key things they spoke about, mental issues. Um, they also spoke about life-giving homilies would make a difference to their lives. So there's also an ask from, from priests that homilies should be lively. Um, this can be also a learning moment. That's the feeling they have. And those that come from Catholic, I think Anglican and maybe some of the churches, they also wanted to hear more about Black saints being shared. There's being a sharing of white saints. That's their feeling. Um, and we'll continue to encourage them and also to see themselves in this journey of being Christians. And also um, more focus on parish retreats, which for young people. Um, and by having saints that reflect them in color, they felt that this would make them to believe in holiness um, the, and also the gifts in holiness. And I think those are some of the things that um, Roberto spoke about this morning that it, for Ignatius, it was a continuous grace even before what we call conversion, but for him, it was even before. And he also mentioned Psalm 139. And also by allowing them to attend these, these parish retreats, would also allow them, though they use the word conversion, 
it will also help them to convert deeper or yeah, to experience conversion deeper and to let go unnecessary stuff. Unnecessary stuff is to a stuff where they were talking about uh, places like Google, where they are getting a lot of unnecessary information. Learning about meditation and contemplation was also key for them. Um, they also are asking for hands-on priests or pastors will help develop in the you yeah will help develop them in their own sense and understanding who they are um and also they spoke about we are not here for mass or just for service um but we we also have a belief that we also are here as individuals to grow that we are asking for growth as we come for mass or service um and also they were asking for substantial teaching, which is something that the church, I think these days is lacking in substantial teaching. Those from the Catholic church who are aware of the Holy Rosary, they said it, it just must be an addition, but the Holy Rosary, the way it appears at this moment, it feels like this is the substantial material. Um, they were also asking that the church for them, they want it to be a lifestyle. They, they feel that the church is not a lifestyle or it's the second thing that they go to. Um, so they said about substance teaching, it will guide them to know themselves as Christians and to understand their Christian life. Um, the church should be part of who I am, my tradition, my culture, and my beliefs. Uh, there was also a, a talk about catechism. I'm not sure what, what happens in other churches. Uh, maybe it's the church's teaching. So they spoke about catechism should be the lasting seed. So the catechism, the way it comes these days, they feel it's not a lasting seed. Um, we should be, be well in our faith and, and be well formed. That's the ask they had. Priests and pastors to stop allowing adults. Earlier on, Murwa spoke about this. Um, sometimes them also as priests being included from bringing their own personal customs to church community, which end up breaking the community. So that was another ask for, for, for from them. Um, and also they felt that the church is stagnant. The church is not moving and it is a problem. We're asking for a moving church. So um, that's really, it's it's a long paper. We, we, we can't go through it. Thanks. We, we just have, covered these few points for you. Thank you so much, Puling and Morongwa, and I hope that they have whetted your appetite to, to read the paper when it comes out, because I think there's, there's something challenging about what young people are saying to us as an Ignatian community, and I think it's wonderful that there's, there's young people give, being given space to, to share their hearts and to say what it is that they need. So thank you, Puling. Thank you, Morongwa. Thank you for sharing the work that you've been doing. Just a taster for us to whet our appetites to, to hear more. Um, please let us know when the paper is ready so that we can, we can circulate it so that people can have a chance to read what I know is a substantial piece of work. So thank you. So we're going to now take both what we've heard from the talk this morning and also just listening to those young people and to Kuleng and Morong were reflecting on their experience as we go into our small groups. Uh, we're going to have about 35 minutes in the small uh, breakaway rooms. I'm going to just screen share where we're going now. So I would ask you um, just uh, 
to just take some time initially to, to just connect with who is who in the group. Um, you probably won't have time to do more than just say your name and where you're from. And then just to maybe share something around the question that Father Arabatore left us with. Your own cannonball moment, a time of stoppage or a crisis, what helped you to see it in a new light, what helped you discover the graces of that moment. And then to, if you have time, to just also say what has stayed with you from this morning, from what you've heard about the young adults, from what you've heard about uh, the, the cannonball uh, perspective on, on conversion. So um, that's going to be where we're going to go next. I have, um, we have asked people in each group, a person in each group to uh, facilitate uh, the sharing, just to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak in the group. Uh, and then we will give you a five minute warning when we're going to bring you back into, into the main group to end our, our time together. So just share your name, where you're from, just to get to know each other question on the cannonball moment and whatever else has really struck you or stayed with you in the time that we've spent together today. So it's now 11.45 and so we will come back at about 20 past 12. So in 35 minutes we will bring you back. So I'm going to ask Sherry Lynn to do her magic and to whisk everyone away into a room to be together for a little while and I hope that you enjoy meeting each other and spending some time with others who are passionate about Ignatian spirituality. So welcome back everyone. I hope that you had a chance to at least get to meet the other people in your group and to begin the conversation. I know that I'm sure there would have been more that you would have loved to have had time to, to say and to share, but I hope you had some opportunity to at least have a taster of that. So we're coming towards the end of our celebration. I just want to make one or two announcements and then we're going to gather the graces of this time and to, to come together in a, in a closing moment. Just to first of all say a big thank you to those who were involved in preparing today. Um, we've already thanked Father Arobato for his, for his time. Uh, I want to thank Morongwa and Kuleng very much as well for giving us some input this morning. Thank you both. Uh, thank you also to those working behind the scenes, to Frank who organized the videos for us, uh, to Jill who did the admin, uh, to Sean who's also been here behind the scenes helping us, to Sherry Lynn putting us into breakaway rooms, um, and anyone I may have forgotten. Um, thank you all for your contribution and, and for making today possible. A reminder that the Institute is also busy today and uh, the reason that not all the Institute staff are able to be with us this morning, is that we also have Winter Living Theology on the go. And at the moment, there are many, many people gathered in Swaziland for the day that's happening, Winter Living Theology there at the moment. We've already been in Cape Town, we've been in Durban, and next week we're going to be at Lumco in Johannesburg for uh, the Winter Living Theology days on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. There's still space. If you want to come, please, uh, Think about joining us. It's a, a wonderful opportunity. Dan Horan is a fantastic speaker, and he's talking about Thomas Merton and some of the, the issues in our own context that are really important to, to be reflecting on in the light of what Thomas Merton has to say. And if you're not able to take three days out of work, maybe come just for a day. You'd be more, more than welcome if you are in the area. We would love to have you with us. There's also a retreat happening uh, called the Franciscan Heart of Thomas Merton. That's from the 5th to the 7th of the evening of the 5th, which is next Friday, 
to Sunday afternoon. So that's also a wonderful opportunity um, to take some time and some space to reflect. So just to remind you that those things are on offer, go to our website if you'd like more information um, or write again to Jill and ask her to, um, to connect you with the same person who has uh, done all the admin for, for today. So retreats at jesuitinstitute.org.za or WLT uh, at jesuitinstitute.org.za. So that's just what I wanted to remind you of and to, to invite you to. So let's just take a moment now to have a moment of prayer to end our, our time together. So I invite you to just sit quietly and to just for a moment notice what has been the particular grace or gift of this day, this time, this morning for you. For what are you most grateful? And when you feel ready, I invite you, if you would like to, to share that in a word or a phrase in the chat so that we can just gather the gifts and the graces that we've experienced together today. And to receive the grace of looking at the gifts and graces of others as they share them in the chat. And so we hold together with gratitude all that we have received as we have spent this time together. The graces that have been shared and are still being shared. And those that we hold within our hearts and our spirits.
and we end in praying in the words of Pedro Arupe. Grant me, O Lord, to see everything now with new eyes, to discern and test the spirits that help me to read the signs of the times, to relish the things that are yours and to communicate them to others. Give me the clarity of understanding that you gave Ignatius. Loving God, as we have come together as an Ignatian community and Ignatian family from different places around the world, we thank you for the gift of this time, for the gift of one another. We thank you for the gift of the cannonball moments in our own lives as we come to see you at work in and through them over time. Fill us with your spirit that as we go out and continue to share what we have received, that we may, each one of us, be deeply blessed by all that we have shared today. We make our prayer as we say together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.